the state of Jesus Christ on this the 18th Sunday after the Pentecost. One brief announcement, this is for the men of the congregation. Uh, there is a fall men's retreat at Stony Island Camp on October 22nd, 23rd. There's a sheet of information about it in the fellowship hall. Uh, what that's going to be about, that, that is for the men of our circuit. Uh, we get together every fall. It's a Friday evening and then a Saturday during the day. Uh, if you can attend, we're going to be talking about this year a uh, very timely topic, talking about men kind of reclaiming being men and our responsibility as house fathers, as the men of the house, the spiritual leader of the house, how to take that back first so that we can witness first to friends and family, and then as the greater church, witness to the world. Uh, so the mission starts literally at home, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's a fairly modest uh, fee uh, to pay for the speaker and uh, the lodging there at Sunny Lake Camp. Food will be then provided. You don't have to spend the night if you don't want to, especially if we were so close, uh, sleeping in our bed and then go for Saturday morning. It's worth the time for a day and a half of your time uh, just to uh, have some devotional time with Mother Luther and then from all, all around the circuit. And, uh, it's a good time. So if you're interested in that, pick up the information sheet. May the Lord bless your worship.
sometimes a little challenging, but it is great. We'll try that again sometime. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful God, I, the poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for that, and sincerely repent of that. And I pray that you for your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. I wish your confession that by virtue of my office is a called and ordained servant of the word announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise to the servants of the Lord. Who stand in the house of the Lord. In the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for the Lord is blessed. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people. Oh, no. 
everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Job, 
and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffered? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Hallelujah.
and I plead the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I plead in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge the one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. It's tiresome when words evolve and change their meanings, sometimes to the complete opposite of what they meant previously. It goes without saying that John and the others were feeling a bit salty because someone who is not a part of Jesus' disciples were performing exorcisms in his name successfully. Remember the fiasco the disciples went through in our gospel reading two Sundays ago when they couldn't cast out a demon while Jesus was up on the mountain of transfiguration. Is it any wonder that their egos were bruised 
and their feelings were hurt. But this is not the kind of saltiness Jesus is calling a good thing this morning. Last week, Jesus used a child to teach his disciples, including ourselves, a lesson about ambition and service, saying, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Today, Jesus is teaching us about tolerance. Tolerance. There's another word that does not mean what we think it means. Not anymore. Tolerance used to mean putting up with something even though you fundamentally disagree with it. And that's still what it means when you look it up in the dictionary, but not what we find today in practice. Today, the world demands we tolerate all manner of sin, yet will not tolerate any words spoken against such sin. Strange how the words St. James wrote almost 2,000 years ago seem as applicable in our world today as they did in his. Of course, it's not that strange if you actually believe that these are the words of God. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The irony of tolerance in the postmodern age is that the world can voice all the intolerance it wants with regard to Christianity. And all of that aside, that's not the kind of tolerance Jesus is talking about today, but the sentiment is similar. John was conflicted because the stranger who was casting out demons in Jesus' name was rebuked and rejected by him and the other disciples because he wasn't a part of their group. Yet Jesus has just gotten done teaching them that they are to receive other people with open arms, hence John's guilty conscience. A man was ministering to other people in Jesus' name, and they stopped him. Why exactly? This fellow was clearly a believer, or he would not have had the ability to cast out demons in Jesus' name. But he wasn't part of the in crowd. He wasn't a part of that inner circle. He was like a ronin, a samurai without a master, kind of like a free agent. In other words, he'd not been called and ordained by Christ. He had not received his teaching from the mouth of Christ. So in John's mind, he could not have been as strong as they were or as firm in his beliefs as they were. And he certainly did not stand together with them, did he? In John's mind, that was the only way to be a follower of the way. Now, how often are we like John? Are we as welcoming in the church as we should be? Do we always make it easy for visitors who may be looking for a new place to call home? Do we make it easy for them to be joiners? Or do we pressure them too much, too soon, to join everything? Because we want them involved in everything immediately. Or have we ever resented when someone new wants to jump right in, and we think they're trying to take over or push us out? All of those things happen in every church from time to time. All of them are sinful. Now look at where you work, your office, any clubs or organizations you might belong to. Opportunities abound for us to be uncharitable, unwelcoming, and intolerant of newcomers. How dare they? Do they know how long I've been a member here? Do you know how long I've been working here? You have to do your time. You have to earn your place in the chart. Now, does it seem like all of those scenarios, all of those hypotheticals, that it's not the newcomer who is the problem? It's actually you. It's actually me. Now, consider this wandering exorcist. Somehow, somewhere, he had heard about and been influenced by the Lord. He had clearly given himself to the work of the ministry for the sake 
and welfare of others. His faith was obviously strong. Look at what he was doing. He was taking on the most complex and difficult of cases, ministering to the demon-possessed to rid them of their affliction, a portion of the ministry which the disciples themselves had had difficulty performing. Now, there are many things in our society that we as Christians should not be tolerant of. But that's not what Jesus has to teach us today in the text from Mark. Instead, our Lord is leading us to be more tolerant of people, especially to those whom we should be more inclusive. There's many reasons we want to be intolerant of others. And they all have as their origin our own broken sinfulness. We're not to be tolerant of sin, but neither are we to be intolerant of that which is not sinning. We become intolerant when we're blindly loyal to an organization or a leader. If someone does not stand with us in this loyalty, he is not acceptable to us. That can be a church body, and ours is far from perfect. It can be a political party. It could be the director of your department, your bureau, or your organization, whatever. A conviction that our own belief or position is the only correct position leads to intolerance. Often when someone has a political stance contrary to yours, all conversation comes to a stop because we believe there's nothing more that can be discussed. They're one of those people, not one of our people. And we do that here in the church as well. Perhaps we Lutherans are actually more guilty and self-isolating than others. Partially because we know we have doctrine right. But that doesn't mean that we are so bright and so special and so holy that we have to abandon our confessions, our sound doctrine, or our liturgical practices to be inclusive. It means we need to talk, we need to listen, we need to discuss and debate, not because we will make everybody see that we are right, though we are, but so we see that we're all Christians. We all believe the same gospel about the same Christ, as Peter wrote, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding work of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The need or the compulsion to achieve unity at any cost creates intolerance. We don't even necessarily realize that we harbor such feelings and are unknowingly triggered to sinful behavior at times when someone questions our position or our actions, we intolerantly and often unconsciously react out of pride, rendering their question unacceptable. Other times, we're jealous of the gifts that another brings to the table, and we defensively dismiss them as being unacceptable. And still other times, our arrogance rears its ugly head as we labor, label another who is too different from us for no other reason than out of fear and arrogance. And before we say, I never do that, remember we do all that unconsciously. Sometimes we sin actively, but very frequently that behavior has become so second nature, it is automatic. That's how broken and sinful our hearts are. Now this outsider exorcist triggered John for one or more of those reasons. And he and the others stopped him from serving because they had labeled him as unacceptable. But John's conscience was bothering him. Enough so, so that he did one correct thing in this situation. He brought his confession 
to Jesus. And what did Jesus say about it? Once again, Jesus' teaching is simple. Don't stop him. Receive him like you would receive a child. Let him work. For truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will no, by no means lose his reward. So if someone is not against Christ, what is John afraid of? What are you afraid of? Think about that and fear not. Just as a man and a woman who get married are no longer two but one flesh, so also is Jesus Christ and his church. For Jesus, he and his church are one and the same. To stand against his church is to stand against him. To mistreat his followers is to mistreat him. To speak evil of his followers is to speak evil of him. You don't have to be a lifelong Missouri Synod Lutheran to be a Christian. The church has enough problems of her own without us squabbling about the little things. Take the difference between the Wisconsin Synod and us. Now behind the scenes, there are major problems we disagree with. To the average person looking at it, they go, what's the difference? Exactly. What's the difference? We don't compromise doctrine. We don't suddenly embrace open communion. We don't suddenly embrace all manner of sin that the world should tell us is, is telling us is acceptable. But we accept and we acknowledge the validity of other followers of Christ. And we don't hinder them. The most terrible sin is leading another to sin. Next week we'll talk about intolerance. Intolerance of our own sin. But the very worst thing we can do is to teach another to sin by our own words and actions. Just like training a child. Others learn to be Christian by watching other Christians. How do they see you? Sometimes I'm embarrassed at how they see me. What are they learning from us? What are we teaching when we downplay sin and give it soft names like our mistakes or our slip-ups? Because that doesn't make it not sin. Jesus provides us with an alternative to such sin in today's text. He said to hang a big weight around your neck and go jump in the lake. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how do you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In those days, salt wasn't as pure as we have. When they dug it up, it had all kinds of other stuff in it. So if your pile of salt got wet and dissolved all the salt, all that was left was rocks. So now your salt is no longer salty. That's what they're talking about. In other words, don't hinder other believers. But all of us stick together and walk in the way that is right and recognize when we do not. It's frustrating sometimes, yes. It's even very challenging. Sometimes it even hurts to do this. But Jesus died for all of that on the cross too, so that he could present us, his bride, the church, spotless and blameless before his Father. So be aware of this. Repent of this. Listen to that nagging conscience and ask for forgiveness. Pray for tolerance. Because the victory over all of these things already belongs to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, keep us from craving and weeping after what we no longer possess, but instead give us contentment in the daily bread you so graciously bring down upon us. Heavenly Father, cause your Holy Spirit to rest upon us and our pastors that they may prophesy your word publicly and faithfully among us. And we, in turn, may prophesy your word in our homes and vocations. O Lord, bless the elders of our church and church council with the necessary gifts of your spirit, that they may faithfully serve the congregation, support our pastor, and uphold the ministry of the word among us. O Lord, uphold all those who bear the sword in our land, that sin and wickedness may be kept at bay, and we may live peaceful lives in security. O Lord, save and raise up those who are suffering or sick with all maladies of spirit or body, or those who are mourning, especially all those whom we now name before you silently. Grant, Lord, that all who come to the altar today to receive the heavenly manna of Christ's body and blood would be well salted with repentance and faith, and be at peace with one another. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, and whatever else you know we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith, now unto eternal life. Depart in joy and peace.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this time for your good. And we implore you, that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you.